winter. <laughs> Thank God your mic is off. <laughs> I see that you all have your bags here. Maybe I should bring mine as well. My bag, my bag is here. I, I got you. <laughs> Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for showing up at our, um, at our session uh, on issues and opportunities for using AI, helping workers reach the target of addressing youth substance use. Um, uh, I'm your chair for today, Matthijs Blankers, and today we'll have three speakers of about 15 minutes, and afterwards, hopefully, time for some discussion among the panelists, and I hope you will also join us in this, uh, in this discussion. Speakers will be having um, our uh, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, Elisa Weitzman, um, Jordi Piera Jimenez, Director of the Catalan Digital Health Strategy Office, and Christina Todorova, who is a researcher at Ireland's National Center uh, for AI. And I'm, my role is to kickstart this, uh, uh, this, this session and this discussion. And uh, to start off, and I think this is clear for all of us uh, visiting this conference over the last two days, uh, there's a global rising burden of addiction, and clearly a treatment gap, a gap between those who would profit from some form of help, prevention, or treatment, and those who actually receive treatment. And at the same time, we're seeing a future with probably a shrinking workforce in addiction care due to aging populations and funding shortages, among other reasons. And therefore, there's clear room for innovative solutions to maintain service delivery and the quality of services, if possible. And AI, digital techniques, AI could be a potential tool to supplement the shortage, 
uh, of workforce and to enhance uh, youth addiction care. Well, but what is AI exactly? I mean, it's, it's something of a buzzword we hear a lot of times also during this conference and I thought for sort of a good mutual understanding of this team uh, to show a, a few of the, let's say, themes and aspects um, which are contained in the overarching theme artificial intelligence or AI. I think for today's talks, what are important themes within uh, artificial intelligence is machine learning, which is basically a technique to, to cluster large amounts of data and to try to extract meaning and coherences between the data points. Uh, natural language processing is important. Uh, it's all about text generation, question answering, machine translation. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are aware of ChatGPT and similar tools, and those are really about natural language processing. Other important aspects and um, um, uh, techniques under the umbrella term artificial intelligence are speech recognition, uh, speech to text or text to speech, and everything to do with vision, image recognition, and machine learning, um, machine vision. So, what can these techniques actually contribute to addiction care? Well, I have highlighted three possible examples, and I'm sure the other speakers will highlight more of them. But for example, machine learning can be used in screening and early detection uh, of people in need for prevention or addiction treatment by analyzing large data sets, for example, from health records, nationwide or uh, regional. Uh, patterns could be recognized and potential cases could be identified early. Another potential application of machine learning models would be personalized treatment. Is it possible, based on the data that's available in electronic patient records, for example, to pre predict for a new patient what would be an optimal treatment path for him or her? A third possible option is automated or at least automated assistance forms of treatment. Think about automated chatbots or virtual assistants to provide motivational support and guidance. And I would then think, mostly as a co-pilot for the therapist to help the therapist to work more effectively. Well, and obviously, besides possibilities, there are also a lot of ethical concerns which we want to address uh, today. Um, I highlight here a, a couple of them, and I think important ones are having to do with data privacy and consent. Obviously, in our field, we work with sensitive personal data, um, so it's important to have good informed consent to make sure data are, are anonymized before they are fed and used in uh, AI models. Another important uh, aspect is the potential risk of bias and discrimination. Um, AI models are only as good as the data they are trained on. Uh, so if we start with biased data sets, because, for example, uh, marginalized uh, populations are underrepresented in the data, this may affect the use and um, validity of our AI models. I think a third important aspect we have to make sure we take into account is the risk of loss of human connection. I think in, in treating patients, in, in therapy, an important aspect is uh, empathy and trust in recovery. And this, I think, is covered much better in person-to-person -person contact than in person-to-computer contact. So AI, I think, could never rule out the important uh, role of humans in the therapeutic process, but may be helpful in supporting the human-to-human -human, uh, therapeutic interactions. Also, accountability and quality, uh, who is responsible if clinical decisions are partly made by AI tools, and access and equities, how do we make sure that also the less rich and less developed regions worldwide have access to new AI tools in order not to large, uh, enlarge uh, differences between populations are important concerns to take into account. So, to pose some questions and to leave the, this to the other um, uh, speakers, um, is AI a powerful tool for uh, improving care quality and efficiency? Is, has it have potential to overcome human research shortages while providing personalized care? Or are we seeing a, a sort of top of the hype cycle where there are over exaggerated expectations based on things that theoretically could work or could work, uh, but while we ignore important implementation challenges? Well, either way, uh, ethical oversight is essential for all future AI applications. And a big question, of course, is how can this be ensured and how can this be organized? Well, with that, I would like to bring you to the next phase of this, uh, uh, of this talk. We have three experts 
uh, we were going more into depth uh, on the different aspects of using AI for youth addiction care. Uh, Elisa Weisman from the US, Jordi Piera Jimenez from Spain, and Christina Todorova from Ireland all have their specific views on what's important when considering the use of AI, what are possible applications, what does not work. They each will present about 15 minutes and then there's room for discussion and also I invite you to think about what do you want to know about AI and the use in youth addiction care, what, what questions do you have. So for now I would like to give the floor to Lisa Weisman to tell us everything about the digital phenotyping and specificities of using AI with youth to reduce drug harms. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And a genie is operating behind me somewhere to bring my slides up. That's great. Okay. So I have a, an incredibly ambitious task, I think we all do, which is to give a very brief presentation about an incredibly complicated topic. Can you hear me okay? I think everybody can hear me okay. Um, in about 15 minutes, which is a little bit of a suicide mission. And, um, and really the intention is to give us room to talk among ourselves, because we've had a couple prep calls um, in advance of the session. And at least for me, what I noted is that all of us consider ourselves to be, would you say, inadequate or somewhat incomplete with regard to mastery of a very complex topic. So rather than just blabbing on, I think getting to the point where we can really talk among ourselves from our different disciplinary perspectives seems a very worthy goal. So my goal is to just equate you with some of the issues around the use of AI for use around substance use issues. I don't have any conflicts, but I'll let you know that I have an advisory relationship with OVAX Inc., which is working on a fentanyl vaccine. And the high points of my talk are the chapters of my 15 minutes today are just brief overview of adolescent substance use, some uh, orientation to service and workforce gaps in the United States, uh, inflection points really where we might introduce AI in substance use care for adolescents and then um, shine a light on some of the cautions and the directions for this work. Okay, so very rapidly, and I, I do wanna say that I'm gonna talk about this work in the context of the United States, primarily some of the obviously ethical and Practical issues are going to be shared internationally, but the U.S. is its own regulatory um, clinical health service ecosystem. So substance use disorders are a pediatric onset condition. This is national survey data on the screen in front of you. They simply show the age of onset, right, um, of substance use, any substance use, for individuals who reported no substance use in the past year. And that tiny little bar on the right, this is irritating, um, indicates that uh, very few, vanishingly few individuals actually start substance use in adulthood, okay? And I'm gonna assume that we all agree that substance use disorders are multi-determined, they're preventable, and they're treatable. And in the United States, interestingly enough, substance use rates are declining, while substance use disorder rates are increasing sharply, comorbidities are worsening, and I would say systems to address these problems are deeply stressed. This slide shows you just prevalence estimates over a decade nationally in the United States, where if you read down, you see current alcohol use among adolescents. 10 years ago, about 11% of youth reported this. 2022, 7%, so that's that consistent downward trend. However, among those youth who are using alcohol, rates of disorder are really skyrocketing. They've gone from about 18% to 29% in that decade. Similar pattern is seen for cannabis use. So 7% of youth reported cannabis in 2013, somewhat fewer by 2022, but wow, look at the doubling, incredible doubling of rates of disorder related to cannabis use by, you know, 2022, going, going from 28% to 59%. And uh, among adolescents in the United States, nearly 9% report having had a substance use disorder, if that's nationally. So a lot of kids, lowering rates, increasing severity, right? 
Many youth, of course, have co-occurring conditions. Uh, one would be major depressive disorder and substance use disorder. To give you just some indication of the treatment gap, these are national survey data among youth with these co-occurring disorders. About half report receiving mental health support or treatment. Nearly a third receive no treatment at all. One in five report getting some care for both conditions. Fewer than 2%, about 1% report getting substance use only, right? So big treatment gap. And then thinking about our capacity for care and access to care, unlike what I've heard over the last two days about publicly supported adolescent treatment programs, in the United States there's really no layer of clinical care that looks like that. So these are largely private programs. Of all the treatment programs in the United States, one out of four accept adolescents. The average wait time to get into a residential treatment program, if you are a teenager, is about one month, 28 days. An upfront cost to enter that treatment program, meaning how much money you have to hand over to walk in the door, is about $29,000. So just, just let that settle, okay? I think that's probably pretty different from what many of you experience in your uh, settings and systems here. So the confluence of those patterns, right? Downward use, increasing severity, lack of treatment resources, lack of access, really has, as I've said, created this incredible pinch in terms of adolescence. And there are four places we might introduce um, AI. One, you've already heard, screening and documentation issues. Two would be decision support. Three would be in the area of motivational interviewing, brief interventions and therapy, right? That's through relational agents and chatbots. Fourth would be training. I've graded out. I'm just out of time to talk about that. Screening really would involve, in an ideal case, processing multimodal data, so biologic data, EMR data, social media data, survey data, and school data, right, community data, to identify youth at risk and then computing those data using a variety of tools to identify and predict risk for youth. And in fact, some of this work is happening primarily around EMR data, okay? There are considerable barriers to moving this work forward. As Matthias mentioned already, substance use data are sensitive, they're stigmatizing, they're actually missing, not completely, but largely from a lot of electronic medical record data, and where they're present, they typically describe select groups. Adolescents are a healthy group. They come into healthcare settings rarely, so there's censoring of these data by time. There's no universal ID to link across these data sources, and there are myriad privacy and confidentiality issues at play. For example, schools can't share substance use data with basically anybody in the United States. It's against the law. Okay, what about decision support? In the United States, extremely few pediatricians and healthcare providers are trained in addiction medicine, okay? So um, it would be, ideally, wonderful if big data analysis could support decisions and clinical activities, right? Treatment planning, medication planning, reminders and diagnoses. That's an ideal case, but as mentioned, Biased information really feeds these AI models, and therefore you have the risk of amplifying bias, right? So as Lee et al. I think very eloquently stated, training uh, machine learning models on human biases may lead to the pernicious propagation of inequity. Pernicious propagation of inequity. And what does that look like? So when I prepared for this talk, I actually, um, at, a, at a hospital instance of ChatGPT, I developed some standardized vignettes describing young people and their potential uh, presenting characteristics, right? With the purpose of asking what kind of treatment would be recommended for this young person. So here's one case. This is a 21-year-old woman. She recently started psychiatric treatment for PTSD. That was related to military trauma. She's screened by substance use by a clinician. She reports occasional marijuana use. Two instances, just two, of using a prescription pain medication that was not prescribed to her. And then the query to the prompt to chat GBT was, what kind of treatment would you recommend for this young woman? 
Now, interestingly, when I named this young woman Sarah, which is in the United States typically the name of a Caucasian or white individual, this was the list of treatment recommendations I received. Psychotherapy, integrated treatment, substance use treatment, where it's really focused on coping strategies and the underlying reasons for substance use. That's sort of a, a kind, compassionate framing of the problem, would you agree? And along with that came supportive services for Sarah. Now, I cleared the chat history and asked the exact same question for a 21-year-old named Imani. I got trauma-focused therapy, medication for PTSD, substance use treatment that might include intensive outpatient program, inpatient, or residential rehab. Now, when I read that line, I thought, wow, Imani really has a like, profound substance use disorder, right? We're not talking coping strategies and what are your reasons and motivations. We're you know, talking about somebody with a severe disease. She also got a recommendation for integrated treatment. No medications for substance use were recommended and no supportive services were recommended. I'm bringing this up in its specifics because I think it's very easy for all of us to think, huh, you know, bias, bad data, uh, we'll have to correct for that. I think it's much harder to imagine at the point of care or in another setting what that translates to when you are in your office, a patient walks in the door, you're not trained adequately as a clinician or peer support individual, and you go to a, some sort of platform and you say, here are the conditions, this is my patient, right? What do I do with this patient? And then realize those data are built on something that's fundamentally flawed in important ways, that carries assumptions that are hard for you to discern. Now, of course, this has all been documented in administrative data and you know, large data analyses of cl clinical treatment patterns. And here you just see in this screen racial differences in the prescribing of medications by race and ethnicity. So exactly what we just saw for Sarah versus Imani is present. These data are what are being used to train these you know, systems. Here's a second one, a 15-year-old boy, and I've tightened this up, reports prescription um, medication use, again, non-medically, takes it from his home medicine cabinet. He's done it five times in the past two weeks. He uses marijuana regularly, okay? He vapes nicotine. His parents know about the marijuana and the vaping, but they don't know about the Percocet use, okay? So the pediatrician talks to the boy, and the mom says, Okay, I'm going to lock up all the medicines from the cabinet. We're going to button this up. What kind of treatment would you recommend? Kevin, likely white, gets assessment and screening, a brief intervention, referral to specialized services for substance use disorder, a concurrent mental health evaluation, harm reduction strategies, family involvement, ongoing support, right? In addition, there's a note. The mother should be encouraged to securely store or dispose of any used or unnecessary medications to the, reduce the risk of misuse, which, of course, was part of the vignette that I presented, right? What's the assumption? Intact family. There's a mom. Active, caring, present. You can talk to her. Jamal, with the same presentation, gets everything that Kevin got, but there's no message about what do we offer the mom? And how do you talk to the mom to you know, control that home supply? So clear indication that there's some important, powerful assumptions about family structure, parental involvement. And I want to say that you know, we read these academic papers. We assume we're going to see this stuff. To me, and I'm a scientist for 20 years, when you drop this stuff into chat GBT, you submit the prompt, you ask, what should I do? And the first responses come back looking like this. I'm not, it's not a needle in a haystack. That is a sh that's shocking. That was shocking. So let's move on. Um, I wanted to talk, and you've already mentioned it, Matthias, about brief interventions, texting, and chatbots. The figure on the upper left of your screen is a visualization from the National Science Foundation platform that uses AI-driven narratives to engage adolescents in 
motivational interviewing, goal setting and scenario problem solving. That's the INSPIRE project. You can find this paper in the Journal of Adolescent Health. Um, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, just published a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, finding text messaging, AI-powered text messaging, is effective at reducing cigarette use among adolescents in a randomized clinical trial. Okay? So these, these programs are making their way out there. They're effective. They're creative. However, a large majority of Americans don't actually want AI anywhere near them in terms of their mental health care. Okay? So this is national survey data, the percent of US adults who say they would use artificial intelligence in their mental health care. 80% say, uh-uh. Not only that, I think when you're thinking about children and adolescents, we, there's, there's somewhat of a different burden when we think about a vulnerable population, right? By and large, again, in the US, these are commercial products. Okay, so commercial products are obligated to, to make a business bottom line, that's fin financial viability. This uh, commercial product, which was, oh, my cursor's there. Um, this company actually raised venture capital money to the tune of nearly $20 million and built an AI chatbot friend named Ed that the LA public school, Los Angeles public school system adopted and deployed, right? For the, I think they spent $6 million on it. Several months later, so kids started to interact with this. It was to provide social, emotional, mental health support, educational support for kids and parents. Within a handful of months, the company became financially unviable, okay, and stopped. So all the data are out there. Youth who thought they had a friend relationship with Ed, one little girl reported, I think Ed likes me. Okay, um, you know, th this is, I'm putting this out here as one example of, I guess I would say the economic, social, and commercial questions as, you know, that we need to really grapple with in um, an environment that includes public as well as private deployment of these tools. How do we protect young people? And I think Christina's going to talk uh, about regulatory controls. I want to mention something else, and I know I'm, I need to wind up. Um, the United States, and indeed much of the world, is suffering from what I would call a loneliness epidemic, right? In the UK, there's actually a ministerial position that was created, a, a minister of loneliness, right, to address this problem. So, of course, it preceded the pandemic, but it was definitely exacerbated by the pandemic. And we're learning routinely about the negative health effects of loneliness. So, you know, these tools and AI chatbots are being developed to solve, in part, that loneliness crisis. But I'm going to remind us that a lot of the uh, tools and platforms are indeed commercial. So yesterday's New York Times, yesterday, reported on a lawsuit that's filed by a mom because her 14-year-old committed suicide after acquiring a deeply meaningful friend who was an AI chatbot, OK? through a platform that was promoted to solve some of the social isolation and loneliness crisis. So, you know, in a world where youth, let's just focus on youth, poorly distinguish human, non-human, right? That just developmentally, they're gonna be prone, all of us are, to being drawn into these systems. This is something we need to think about. So I'm gonna, conclude by just listing a few cautions, um, and you'll hear a lot of them. Quality, safety, accuracy are concerns given the troves of missing data on these systems. The potential to amplify inequality and disparities, I think we're hitting on that a lot. I didn't really talk about relational blind spots, but I think for those of you doing clinical work, it's very hard to pick up use, you know, to what extent can an AI chatbot or tool or virtual relational agent identify agitation, the, the, you know, dress of a young person? Are they clean? Have they recently had a shower or bath? You know, what's their energy? When you sit next to somebody, maybe they have a good vibe, right? Maybe they're giving off something very different. So these are tells and cues that we rely on to understand well-being. Then there's iatrogenic harm, the potential that technology is going to be employed 
to address the problem that has its origins in isolation and loneliness, right? So that's somewhat paradoxical. Finally, there's the stability and safety of the private sector and its services. And again, from the patient perspective, looking forward, when you go to find a therapist for your child or a specialist or somebody, I don't know about you, but I look up what are their credentials, where did they train, are they board certified, blah, 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 blah. But how do you do that for an AI, for an algorithm? And again, I think Christina might, might talk a little bit about this from a regulatory and safety perspective. Where I see us going, technology and service of human relationships with real benefits to personalization, precision, acceleration, all of that. Um, I would argue that these AI approaches can be used to complement a workforce and really conserve it so that the humans are used where they're most needed given that gap, right? There's potential to address barriers to care, too few providers, nobody in my, you know, remote rural region. And then we need to really focus on how we're going to correct, address, and support fairness, right? That's it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Eliza, I think, for a very uh, impressive and uh, talk and also to give up some considerations of the use of, of AI and, and some uh, potential iatrogenic uh, effects. And, and I look forward in the discussion to hear yeah, what could be maybe first steps to what could we do and what do we need to bef do before we actually going to use AI in, uh, in practice. I would like to invite the next speaker, um, um, uh, Dr. Jordi uh, Piera Jimenez. Director of the Catalan Digital Health Strategy Office. Um, Jordi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Matis. And, and well, especially thank you to, to the colleagues from, from, the, from the WAVE project, uh, Uwan Fleur, for, for having me here, here today. There's, uh, I mean, I'm a strange profile here, I believe, because uh, I am not an expert in addictions nor in, in substance use. Uh, I'm a health informatician, and uh, there's just three things that I want to, to, to explain to you. I also, for me, it's also a suicidal mission. I have more slides than, than Elisa does, but uh, let me see. There's just three ideas that I want to give you. One is, well, what can we do as the health informaticians uh, to support uh, practitioners uh, and also, I would say, uh, healthcare planning authorities and public health professionals uh, in doing your jobs better through the usage or the systematic usage of, of, of such solutions. Second thing is I will provide some examples, real examples of things that we are doing in, 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 in Catalonia. And the last one, and, and giving some room for, for discussion, I will put uh, also on the table which are the main challenges when, when implementing this, which uh, already Matisse did in, in his initial uh, presentation. So basically, uh, for you to understand a bit what, what I will explain today, so my, my role is not uh, being a public health professional. My role is implementing digital health technologies within a, a healthcare system of eight, 8 million people in, in the northern eastern part uh, of Spain. But yeah, uh, when implementing these technologies, we have seen that you, we also have the capacity or, or the ability to support our clinicians and our practitioners uh, in delivering better healthcare services. So at the end, uh, it came for us somehow naturally to, to start some sort of a research group that at the end is sitting on a lot of health data. And what we do from there is, well, again, trying to support you and also trying to maybe spend better uh, the limited budgets that we all have uh, to, manage, uh, to manage such things. So DS3 is, is our research group. So the things that, I mean, we don't want to fake that we are public health professionals. Uh, we are health informaticians implementing uh, this type of digital health technologies. But at the same time, we pursue, I would say, and we face the same challenges as any other uh, public health uh, professional is, is having the only thing or maybe the only difference is that we sit on top of this health data and at the end we are able to influence in the implementation of this different tooling that, that healthcare practitioners are using and therefore, well, I believe that we have uh, some advantages in, uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a lot of examples over the years. We've been able to, to put in place 
a lot of different uh, solutions that systematically utilize uh, health-related uh, data, all this data that is at uh, our disposal, in order to benefit, uh, again, practitioners, citizens, healthcare planners, uh, public health authorities. And here I, I, I added you a, a specific sample of them. Not all of them, uh, again, not all of them are, in fact, none of them are focused on, on, uh, on the addictions field. We have some examples that I will go through uh, afterwards in the, in the field of, uh, of mental health, in, in the broader one. But I believe that, well, the same things that we implement for, for other specialities can be also brought uh, into the field of uh, addictions and, and, and substance use. So, in order to distinguish us from, uh, from public health professionals, we say that we do uh, precision public health. And, well, you know, there's many definitions for this, or we also say that we do digital epidemiology, right? And, and what we do is make the best out of all this data that, that, uh, that we have and that we manage centrally from, from this big uh, regional system that we have. You must think that we have uh, a lot of, uh, we have like 69 hospitals under uh, our umbrella. Uh, it's around 900 healthcare facilities, but we act as a hub for all this data, circulates somehow uh, around us. So what we do is taking advantage uh, from it in order to deliver, well, the best, uh, I would say, counsel uh, or even interventions when we partner with clinicians for them to, to do whatever is best for, for, the, for the citizens, for, for the patients themselves. At the end, the process, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward for us. So basically what you do is, or try to do is, link data that comes from different uh, sources. And, and here I'm talking mainly, obviously, about uh, claims data, I'm talking about EMR data. Lately, uh, we have been successful in also integrating some uh, social determinants of health. I mean, we have, for example, uh, the, the income of uh, a household, and we have some proxies to, to know about this. We also know where the patients live, so we also have developed an index that we are able to proxy uh, according to, well, the postal code of the, of the individual, which is uh, their, possibly their economic status, da da da. So we are able to use all this data, link it all together. Then what we do is use fancy data analytics techniques, name them AI, name, name them machine learning, whatever. And then we try to provide uh, insights that we try to bring uh, into the clinic. And we are able to do such because we are in the implementation of these different solutions. So for example, <coughs> in Catalonia we have um, a unique system that is being used for all of our healthcare professionals. So all primary care is using the same information system that we manage. So we are able to bring uh, this type of insights to them so they can make uh, better, better decisions. Uh, one of the things, and, and Matisse uh, in his introduction was talking about uh, clustering patients. And uh, I truly believe that this is all about uh, clustering patients and being able, or populations, and being able to very specifically uh, do a characterization uh, of their current status, health status, according to, well, all the data that we have available. If you only have claims data, then, well, you need to manage with claims data. When you have uh, social determinants of health, well, the good thing is that you can uh, add all this data. I mean, this idea of risk stratification is not new, it's not from us. You know that uh, Kaiser Permanente, John Hopkins have been working uh, in these ideas uh, for, for uh, long periods, so we have built on that. And we in Catalonia have been able to also develop uh, our own uh, index for risk stratification that we continuously improve uh, when we have uh, new sources uh, of health-related data, and I, and I will talk about this in the coming slides. But, well, the main question is that uh, for this risk uh, stratification tooling, at the end what you have is uh, an overall population that may seem uh, homogeneous, but once you start to dig uh, into them, obviously they have uh, different, uh, different characteristics. So what we do is cluster them according to these characteristics, and our idea is to give insights to the professionals for them to decide. 
uh, maybe this is a discussion for later on whether uh, this type of solutions uh, can decide on their own or not. Uh, what we do in our group is give suggestions and, and uh, we have not gone yet into the, this type of solutions deciding on themselves uh, what to do with, uh, well, with these different profiles uh, of patients or, or, or citizens. So one of the, the solutions that we have worked the most uh, over the years is uh, what we named the Adjusted Morbidity Groups. And it's a solution that we started building, uh, I believe it was maybe 12 or, or 15 years ago, building only on the claims database. So basically building on diagnostics, procedures, hospitalizations, uh, medications of these different patients, which has allowed us to cluster all the population in, uh, in Catalonia in different, uh, in different stratas. And from there, we've been playing a lot with this. At the end, we have a unique, uh, a unique numerical index that defines uh, the characteristics of this uh, specific uh, individual. And we use this for, for different things, and I will have some examples uh, afterwards. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is interesting because, uh, and I want to stop here a bit, because this is uh, something that we developed on our own. On our own. So we basically know uh, how the calculations are made in the, in the underneath, and this has nothing to do with uh, the CRGs, for example, from 3M, which is a black box, or with the John Hopkins, also the ACGs, that it's also a black box. The good thing about this is that we have, so to say, the algorithm underneath. We are able to fine tune this algorithm, and each time that we have new data, we are able to feed in this, uh, this new type of data and fine tune according to, to our populations, which is I believe uh, a very good thing and avoids the, the idea of the, of the black box. So the example of the, of the adjusted mor uh, morbidity groups, what we have is we basically analyze all the different diagnostics that we have uh, from primary care, from hospitalizations. We also analyze the, the medications. We also analyze the, the, the procedures, da, da, da. We also include in there, lately we've been able to start including some social determinants uh, of health, and now we have an agreement with the Department of Social Welfare and Family, uh, which will allow us to have more of this information, and we profile uh, our population. So basically we assign this numerical index that I was mentioning to each of our citizens, and according to this, we try to deliver solutions or to bring these solutions to the clinic thanks to the uh, ability that we have, not only to the clinic, also to inform health healthcare planners and, and public health authorities. And thanks to the ability that we have when implementing uh, digital solutions, we try to also bring this uh, to the clinic. So, for example, we've been able to bring this uh, stratification algorithm into the uh, medical record from primary care, and we are able to give uh, clinicians alerts about the risk of death, uh, of death the risk of uh, admission, or even the, the, the risk of, of, of ICU, so truly uh, hard endpoints that, for example, in patients uh, where we were suspecting uh, COVID, I think it's very interesting insights uh, upon the admission of, uh, of these patients. We also are able to to inform healthcare planning, and this is the duty uh, of the Catalan uh, NHS, which is basically allocating the budget that we have among our different uh, healthcare facilities. In there, what we have been able to do is to demonstrate that our risk stratification algorithm uh, predicts really well uh, the healthcare expenditure, in this case of medications, uh, in the population assigned to a specific primary care center. And we have proven this when uh, going into a high income area, when we have gone into a low income area, and well, the, the savings that we are able to get from there when allocating these budgets uh, account, for example, in this example that you have in here, it's around, uh, well, the cost of 10 GPs uh, in our context, which is uh, a lot of money. Uh, another example uh, is how do we use these tools to inform public health policy? And here 
uh, you must put yourselves in the, in the era of COVID when there was a limitation of, uh, of vaccines, uh, so there were no vaccines for everyone. And what we were able to see is that uh, not just the eldest patients were the ones that had the highest risk uh, of ICU admission, hospitalization of mortality, but that we had patients uh, under the, uh, in other health, uh, no, age strata that uh, had higher risk. So with this, our aim was to inform uh, public health authorities for them to decide to allocate the vaccines to the populations at the higher risk and not to the populations uh, of higher age. At the end, this was not possible. It wasn't, we were not successful, and we ended up giving uh, the vaccines uh, according to age strata, starting uh, from the eldest, which was, well, logistically the, the easiest, but if we have done right and following the data, maybe something else could have been uh, possible. We are also using uh, these uh, algorithms to uh, predict uh, patients that are not going to attend uh, our outpatient consultations. Uh, and we have been, uh, I mean, we have managed to be very specific about predicting this. And we are also using the, the, the comorbidity index as uh, informative to this type of predictions. And then the last one, is uh, some examples on the field of, uh, of mental health. So I truly believe that uh, the information that we mostly have in the EMR does not suffice for mental health, uh, but we have something in Catalonia, which is the remote consultation. Is this a synchronous channel in between the patients and the, and the healthcare professionals in primary care? From there, we have been able to use a natural language processing in there the patients write as they feel, so it's directly them uh, writing about their feelings. Uh, and from there, we've been able to predict a risk of suicide. We have also been able to predict uh, suicidal behaviors, uh, accounting to, to this data. And then one of the fanciest analyses that we have done, uh, emerging from the, from the Trajectome project, is well also including in this risk stratification or also including genomic data in order to profile patients and to predict trajectories uh, in the field of uh, depression. And then uh, this, is, this is my last one. I mean, there's, there's uh, a lot of advantages in, in, in doing digital epidemiology or, or precision public health. Uh, I believe these solutions uh, have a lot of value and that they can be and they should be implemented and they have a role to support uh, the workforce, also the one in addictions and, and, and substance use. But uh, still, uh, I'm doubtful about the data of the EMR. We have concerns about, uh, about this data and whether this data does suffice uh, to, to really understand what is going on uh, with this type of patients. Also, we have talked and we will talk more about the, the black box uh, algorithms. Uh, the examples that I was using is with things that we have developed, so it's no black box for us, but all the companies and industry that are telling, trying to sell this, we don't know how, how they have been done, in which data they have been, uh, they have been trained. There's also, and, and Christina will go into that, uh, all the new regulation that we are facing in Europe and how this will end up uh, affecting us, and then, I would say one of my main concerns is how all these fancy things that we are able to do with health data, how we do manage to bring this uh, into routine care. I mean, we, we spend a lot of efforts into developing these tools, but then, uh, yeah, clinicians do not trust them and, and they don't use them. And, and this is for us a challenge. Maybe here implementation science can, can, can help, but yeah, uh, this is something that I would also like to bring into, into the discussion. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. And uh, I especially like the term precision public health. And, um, and I also liked what you showed, uh, how um, uh, impressive, basically, you can make the data work for professionals. And to really see that uh, the anal analysis on the data you prepared are really helping professionals to do their work uh, better. So, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask our third speaker to um, take the floor, Christina Todorova from the Ireland's National Centre for AI. 
Um, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Oh, wow, no pressure. A lot of people here. Um, so I will speak mostly from the perspective of a technologist, uh, although I do have uh, some background in psychology. I do hold a master's in psychology. Um, and uh, the topic of addiction is uh, one of a personal significance, so I'm very, very glad that I have the chance to speak uh, to all of you today and talk at the convergence of those three topics. So in my talk, I will focus a bit on the prosaic challenges, like the very down-to-earth challenges that uh, prevent us in using AI for particularly for behavioral uh, addiction treatment. However, uh, you will find that those are applicable for other, f other fields of uh, application of AI in healthcare and beyond healthcare, uh, like in general. Uh, we already acknowledged a lot uh, implementations of uh, artificial intelligence in substance abuse uh, treatment, so I will not go into too much details uh, about, about that. Um, we do have some research that shows that AI has been uh, successfully used. However, in the field of behavioral addiction, we don't have as much research. And, um, oh no, I'm worried that I have my uh, slides that are not um, the updated ones. Never mind. Um, for behavioral addictions, I have, um, I just want to pay attention here that I have included uh, eating disorders as well. I know that there was some uh, discussion in the previous session here whether eating disorders have uh, some sort of place here. I included them because uh, of the lack of control that is associated with them, with the emotional regulation aspect of uh, uh, eating disorders and as well as, uh, you know, um, Basically, basically using uh, eating disorders as a coping, um, as a compulsive behavior, as a coping mechanism. So, some uh, potential uh, fields where um, AI could have, uh, you know, um, could play a large role uh, could be supported, supporting the extended addiction workforce. So AI, and today there is a European wide session on AI in education. Uh, so there are some ethical and beyond that aspects um, of using AI for education, but especially for extended workforce where we have such a large addiction crisis on board and we need all the power we can get. Um, we can use AI to support the training. Uh, for instance, we, um, I also have a poster at this conference with my colleagues uh, from CEDAR where we use uh, large language model tra trained by us to uh, support um, learners by explaining concepts in videos. So like a learner is watching a video and then they ask the chatbot, hey, uh, can you explain this part to me? And then he explains it based on a database that we, uh, we insert. Um, this could be done by uh, tailoring and making more accessible education by um, producing diagrams or by producing um, various like, mm, test cards and flashcards and etc. Uh, risk assessment for behavioral addiction uh, and not only risk assessment, I would like also to add here uh, any type of assessment for behavioral addiction. And we know that most of those are done by the DSM. So here um, in this conference yesterday, someone spoke about the um, problem with that and how we should find different approaches for assessments that combine DSM with, with other uh, uh, with other methods, here AI can help as well. Early detection for behavioral addiction, support treatments of plans, personalization. So maybe I can, oh no, this, I just have a hard time reading the, um, uh, this part of the presentation where I wrote them down. Uh, but yeah, and real time intervention with the chatbots that we all discussed earlier. So. We do have some nice perspectives, but we do have a lot of prosaic challenges. Uh, I'm going to speak about all of them uh, in separate slides, so I'm not going to pay too much attention to this slide. So one of the biggest problems, I think, of including AI into addiction research and specifically for behavioral addictions is, is it worth it? We actually don't know. There is not too much research to uh, say whether specifically for behavioral addictions, if that is worth it. Um, 
despite some notable advances, we do not have the data to support um, to support us saying like, yeah, AI is worth it in addiction or no, no, it's not uh, in, in any of those uh, application areas. So for me, um, this, is, this is a problem um, that has like two sides. One of the sides is that we are expecting a lot of funding that is related to um, integrating AI in healthcare. However, we, we do lack specifically uh, the knowledge whether uh, or how uh, this, this actually works in practice. Uh, some complexity issues. So behavioral addiction is a bit more tricky uh, in that regard because it's not as quantitative, it's more qualitative. However, like what novel research area doesn't have uh, an, a portion of complexity um, inside of it. Um, misaligned approaches here. Um, so in data science, there is something called data input paradigm, like the cognitive paradigm behind a person when they input data. So when you have um, data science algorithm and um, you know that you are doing data uh, in order to be able to use it for um, artificial intelligence analysis, you pay attention to how you input data and you have specific data input protocols. We don't have this so far. The electronic health trackers are held in very different um, data input standards. And there's also something else I would like to highlight here. Um, I don't think this is an AI problem. I think this is a problem of society. Um, it's the stigmatization of um, like addiction treatment and like psychiatry in general. Uh, a lot of the qualitative data that could be used and analyzed by uh, AI uh, is not input by professionals, simply not put because they don't want their patients to be stigmatized. And yesterday we had an informal conversation with Elisa in, in the Uber back to our hotel. Um, where she enlightened me that in pediatrics this is like even more uh, more prominent as an issue uh, because you know that health record is left there for the rest of this person's life. Um, so here is the problem with the missing slide that I added today uh, in my presentation. Uh, I've added a big big roadmap of uh, all the European regulations since the 2018 until 2024. So each year, starting from 20, uh, 2018, we have had at least three major regulations and ethical guidelines and whatnot published, um, supporting uh, mainly like uh, AI integration and ma um, um, AI development. So three per year, this makes at least 12 major uh, regulatory advances in the EU for the past several years. So the ethical and the regulatory aspects, they are being somewhat taken care of. Uh, this July, um, on the 12th of July, uh, the AI, AI Act, the European AI Act has been put into force. So now we have two years to start adapting it in practice. There are also other comorbid laws, so to say, um, like the Cybersecurity Act, the General Data Protection Regulation Act, and all of those come into interplay. So the topic of ethics and regulation has always been there for healthcare, and like the topic of psychiatry per se is um, a very prominent example of where we have a lot of bias, like Alyssa said. Um, one of the problems with regards to ethics in AI that we generally hear here is data confidentiality, which is a problem that, um, that is here not only in AI, but like in, in every system you have data confidentiality problems. I come from a cybersecurity background originally, so um, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data is something that we always discuss when we discuss a system regardless of what it is. So this is a problem that's not AI native. It's a problem that we always had 
like in financial systems, in energy systems, in uh, whatever critical infrastructure you can think healthcare uh, as well. And the topic of bias here, I would like to put forward the idea that it is not AI that is biased, it's actually us. And the problem is that AI works on data that we collect. So here, like, we can, we can see the bias in more now because everyone has access to, to AI, which was not the case like a few years ago or like a decade ago. But now we all see how, how biased we all are. Do you remember this, this um, use case, I think? Um, someone puts a chatbot or whatever on Twitter and like a day after that chat, chatbot became a Nazi or something and become like a racist and started putting like racist slurs everywhere and started coming. Like it's, it's our problem as a society and we, there are mechanisms in data science that you can use to reduce bias and those are stipulated in the regulatory guidelines that the European Union for instance pushes out. But we do need to be more mindful of how we collect data and how we, as, and you especially as professionals, uh, have to have this oversight of data. AI is nothing but a tool and it's not like a panacea for, for addiction treatment. It's a tool that you have to give uh, careful attention to and the outputs of. So we do have um, several things in terms of regulation. Um, there are countries, most European countries do. I know United States does as well. Some Asian countries also that provides um, healthcare uh, professionals access to regulatory sandboxes. So a sandbox is basically a place where you can tr test your algorithm in a self safe environment. So you can see if it complies with regulations and ethical guidelines. So this could be a potential, uh, you know, a solution to some regulatory um, problems that some algorithms may face. And also there are Specifically, um, the problem with ChatGPT is that it's trained on a lot of data that is not necessarily ethically sourced. So there's a lot of data with um, intellectual property inside, which is the problem of many artists that, that face because like what ChatGPT would produce now is basically regurgitating um, the work of other people. So uh, because of that, there are some um, models that are built based on specifically on ethically sourced um, data. There are some several UGPTs. One of them is Hominis that is developed in Netherlands. I forgot the name of uh, another one um, that has been um, developed, I think, in, in Germany. So there are some solutions, especially for the European context. A big one for me, because I work in the intersection of education right now, is the lack of awareness and possibilities. And here on the, what's that? On the left side for you, uh, on the right for me. No, it's on the right side for you as well. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, Dublin seems to be able to confuse that concept for me because people drive on the other side there anyway. Um, on the right, I've put um, this from the people outside of the EU might not speak a lot, but these are basically um, the difference documents that serve as glossaries for us to have a common language about education. So for instance, the European competence frameworks, it lays out um, different competences that are native to several professional profiles that are listed in, you know, um, for instance, uh, the European qualification framework. And all those interplay so that universities can basically maintain uh, their programs. So <laughs> what I wanted to say here is, I don't know if you see it very well, but um, we have a ton of regulations, like I mentioned, at least 12 for the past five, six years. Um, only now in 2024, ESCO, the European Skills Competence Qualifications and Occupations Framework has been updated. Um, the other ones have not. And this is the place where I say that my opinion does not necessarily affect that on, of WAVE or of the European Commission or of CEDAR, but I think while we are very good at putting um, out regulations, we're not good at putting out education, like funding and education, 
because education seems to lag behind of all those regulatory um, efforts. And in 2020, I participated in a group that um, uh, delivered the first um, European level um, master's program in ethical artificial intelligence. And we had a huge issue because we had to explain at universities, um, it was a technical master's degree, so it was for technical professionals because they have to know about those regulations. They're going to go to the markets next year and they don't, they don't know how to implement ethical practices. And we had a huge problem to even describe to universities the need of putting ethical, ethical guidelines inside their programs and how to uh, speak of that language, how to create disciplines, how to create new subjects. So the topic of education is a big one for me and it's a very prosaic challenge that has nothing to do with AI and has everything to do with people and how they view like progress and innovation and how education seems to lag behind. And also because journalism is a very hard discipline um, and journalists are not technologists, I think there has been a lot of propagation of disinformation and of um, fear mongering and myths about what AI is and what its possibilities are. So I think that one thing can be done to improve our ability to integrate ethic, uh, um, ethical AI in the domain of um, addiction services is to talk about it uh, with awareness and talk about it with, you know, um, educatedly, so to say. So all of us know by now, being in this conference, that there is a huge problem here with uh, addiction on the rise and workforce being burnt out. So in, in my opinion, what we can do is just let's um, lobby for better research uh, of whether AI is suitable as a mechanism to work. Let's lobby for um, education and at least an, an elective course in, in medical education that's on, on AI or something like that. Because if it's a tool that can actually help, I think, oh, oh, why not research it? And um, one thing that it can help with um, in terms of uh, real world simulations and adaptive learning, um, AI has already been used for synthetic use cases. However, for behavioral research, I think this, this could be an invaluable approach. Uh, so, yeah, um, just to uh, finish, uh, to wrap this talk up, um, I think I heard a lot around this conference some, um, you know, some concerns about the data, some concerns about um, you know about the ethics and I think those are very important and it's amazing that um, you as medical professionals as people who, who work um, with people uh, are considering um, but those are not things that we see here for the first time they have been around for decades, centuries um, eras um, so it just with AI, the impact is very cascade and very, uh, very severe. And we have to be um, mindful for, with that. But those things are like, we try to take care of, we try to take care of them and we try to, uh, to make this available. So please don't be discouraged as with medication. Uh, you know, medication could be very unsafe, but does this mean that we do not prescribe it? M no. It means that we can test it. We run trials, we, run, we make prototypes, we do uh, control groups, we do clinical trials. And it's the same with AI, I think, in that regard. I want to thank you all for your kind attention and the amazing work that you're doing in your day-to-day. Uh, your -day. And I want to take away for this invitation and for the lovely person here who is uh, drawing all this and making sense visually of uh, all we are speaking. And so, uh, yeah, looking forward to your questions in the panel. Please, if you want, you can save my contacts. I can send you this presentation afterwards so you don't have to use your photos if they're blurry or whatever. And yeah, thanks.
Thank, thank you very much, Christina. I think for a very clear talk on uh, a number of the regulatory issues related to AI and uh, the European AI Act. And uh, I also thought your, your quote uh, a bit paraphrased, but AI is not a bias, but we are as enlightening and, and, and clear. Um, I think now we're for the final part of this, uh, of this session, and uh, I think the floor is also a bit open now to you. Um, uh, thus far, we haven't really had time to ask questions in between, but now we're basically looking for may maybe also some of the bigger questions or maybe small questions from you to our panelists, and they'll try to answer your questions as, uh, as good as possible. So, who may I invite to ask the first uh, question? I see a gentleman over there. Yeah, please. Thank you. I would like, my question is about the European Health Data Space. Um, perhaps it's for Jordi, my, my question. Uh, according to you, what could be the use of AI with the European Health Data Space, primary use and secondary use? Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, well, Christina was mentioning about all this regulation that is uh, coming now through, uh, being the European Health Data Space and also the, the AI Act possibly the most, the most known. Uh, many countries see this uh, as an opportunity. There's many countries in Europe that haven't successfully been able to exchange information uh, within their borders. So I'm, I'm thinking about, I don't know, France, Germany, there's many countries that haven't succeeded in doing such. So they see the, this as an opportunity for, for these things to happen. Uh, we need to be careful with this because these regulations uh, have been approved at the European level and now they need to be transposed into the country level regulations. And let's see how this will be because normally you know that then they are most restrictive every time that you yeah, undergo a, a process of transposition. But I truly believe it's an opportunity and, and it's the bit for Europe. Uh, Christina was mentioning that well, the ethical and the regulatory aspects are taken care of, and, and it's uh, because of this... Uh, Somewhat oh. taken care of, of course. Yeah. Don't rely on that. But. With these regulations, I'm worried, uh, and this is a thing that also Christina has mentioned, and I haven't gone very technical with this, which is on how the data will end up in the European health data space, and that's worrisome because there's many different standards to represent uh, clinical knowledge within the technical landscape. Uh, and now the proposal was to exchange PDFs. And well, it's quite limited, the things that we can do with PDFs. So hopefully someone will make some sense out of that. And uh, the European health data space won't be just a, a trash can uh, full of PDFs, but we will have richer data sets in there for us to be able to build such solutions because they need rich data sets and not just uh, PDFs. So I think it's a source of opportunity, but, but we need to get it right. That's my answer. And, and, and does any of the panelists want to add to that? Um, I would definitely agree with uh, Georgi on his take that it's an opportunity and it has its own sets of challenges. Um, what worries me is that um, if not implemented correctly, this transition could result in using too much synthetic data for training of algorithms, which in the case especially of addictions and healthcare, um, if, you know, it's, there's no, no one single generic approach that might work, so we might come up with some uh, bad conclusions. And in, you know, there's this principle in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence that is junk in, junk out. So the quality you, you have at the baseline uh, is the quality you are going to receive. So I really hope that there are some, I'm not too familiar if there are some efforts to improve the quality of this data that is there, but I hope they are. And I hope there's a lot that can be done there to, to help out. Okay, thank you. Uh, just yes, thank you. A question for Jordi and Marika Ferri working at the European Monitoring Center. Oh at the European Union Drugs Agency, sorry. And, and uh, I'm fascinated by your analysis because I think it can be costly in the beginning, but then considering that we need to respond, for example, to threats, the, the saving of resources that we could do if we could uh, invest our resources in areas that are more at risk than others would be immensely useful. 
My question is about technology has also improved the encryption systems. Is any hope? Because we recognize the importance of having the protection of privacy of clients is fundamental. Still, how can we overcome? Can the technology help to improve the encryption system so that finally we will be able to work on real records rather than in projections only? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, yeah, here, here it's, also, it's also linking a, a bit uh, with the question of uh, our previous colleague on the, on, the, on the European health data space. It's clear that to do certain things, we need to be able to clearly uh, identify, identify patients and to be able to link data from, from many different sources. And for this, we need to be able to distinguish, uh, well, one the, the different sources and how to link them, and in here we need a digital identity, name it a European digital identity whatsoever, because still uh, we have many different uh, digital identities or national identities. In the US, you haven't succeeded to have a unique patient uh, identifier. But uh, at the same time, we need to maintain, I mean, this, this, uh, this data safe and secure technology for sure can help. There's different uh, models of information system that uh, fully, uh, I would say, separate uh, demographic data and identification data from the health-related uh, information. And this uh, demographic data with the identification, so to say, stays in a separate database which is fully protected. Uh, proceeding in this way uh, and uh, technologically would be feasible and uh, the benefits are enormous because these data sets or the concern that Christina was putting on the table that we don't have enough data for students or to train these algorithms, ta, 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 uh, at the end all the time is a problem of anonymization and how we do this right and how we are not able to anonymize or they anonymize. Ta, ta, ta. So I truly believe that, yes, I mean, uh, technology can help us to, to support this, and it's a matter of getting right the, the, the standards on the, on the European health data space and forcing, well, in, in case of us in Europe, and forcing legislation to, to help achieve such. And here we will have to fight, uh, and that's my last thing in, the, in this question, against the lobby of the electronic medical record builders. I mean, these, these guys, uh, operate as a mafia, and they don't want uh, the data to be disclosed from, from the EMRs. They just uh, give us some hints of the data which is, uh, which is in there. And, uh, and they promote certain standards uh, that just are a bit of the full richness of what they have inside of there. So there's a lot of semantical loss when uh, well, implementing certain standards in front uh, of others. So we need to be aware because these guys are very powerful and are whispering into the ears of the European Commission where this should go, uh, and that's a problem. I just want to pose a general question or layer onto that. We can have an ambition of a universal health ID or a patient identifier, but the reality is many of the most informative pieces of information about us as humans exist outside of healthcare. And that may be especially so for kids, right? Because as I mentioned, they're generally healthy, they rarely come into clinical settings, they're not uh, thoroughly evaluated, and also the life course is very dynamic, so you can talk to a young person, you know, over several months and much has changed. And so my, I guess my <laughs> musing here is how much should this conversation consider extra medical or clinical inputs to these algorithms? You know, the place that may be most developed for this would be social media data and device data, right? Where, you know, your phone captures how fast you're walking, the evenness of your gait, are you standing upright, your, you know, fingers, you all know this, right? Like it's all actually being captured by your phone. That's very powerful predictive information for functioning. And, you know, but that is not integrated with any other clinical data, 
right? School performance information for students is powerfully predictive of well-being, household organization, future health status, but that's completely uncoupled from clinical information, right? And so, I don't know, you know, it's hard enough, certainly in the United States, and thinking about electronic health record companies who've monetized the data within them, and there are many of them, and they, you know, don't want to share that necessarily or expose it. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think it's, uh, it's a head scratcher, right? Like, how, you know, how much do we tolerate the narrowness of view of clinical data, and where can we um, expand, right, our, our vision and our ambition to include other kinds of information, what would be required technically for that, what would, what would be gained. Um, and then, as with everything, you know, my tombstone is going to say, you know, uh, sociology is harder than technology, <laughs> you know. But the human barriers are, are, I think, very huge. The societal barriers to that kind of integration are big. So. Yeah, I just love this question, and I can't can't pass to comment on it from um, basically a bit more like technical perspective. Maybe for those of you who are seduced by data security a little bit, but. Um, there are approved encryption algorithms that are considered safe for the moment because uh, with the advancement of quantum computing it is said that our only hope will be homomorphic encryption so there are for the moment we are safe however technology can make it and break it is what i'm actually trying to say and ai has been used to help that so in the european discussion on ai and security there is the concept of Cybersecurity for AI, AI for cybersecurity, and misuse of AI. So when we talk about AI for cybersecurity, we often discuss um, this concept of AI helping us to anonymize and pseudonymize um, data, so as to help us mask the data that is um, used for sensitive purposes, because healthcare data is considered sensitive data, and all of that healthcare data has different regulations on how it is protected and how it should be protected. So. AI can definitely help. Can it help for a long time? Can it combine with other technological environments to, to help us in the long run? We don't know. It's a very interesting time for people to live, I think. So just wanted to comment on that. I'm very, very happy that I heard the word encryption at a conference for addictions. It's, <laughs> yes, my sister. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. If, if I can, uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I think Elisa made uh, a, a very interesting point, which is whether do we have the right data in order to deal with uh, specific uh, patient or citizen profiles. And uh, if you think it through, I mean, from a healthcare system perspective, the most granular data uh, and the most quality data is the one that we have when people is admitted in the ICU. In there, we have continuous data, uh, which is collected by, by machines that have undergone uh, an homologation process and continuous reviews da, 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 about the data they collect continuously. Then uh, the second best data that you have is from patients that you have them admitted in a hospitalization unit. And, da, 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 and when you start going down to this, uh, through this pyramid, when patients are at the community and are in a more or less healthy condition, we know nothing about them. So uh, how do we manage to link all these uh, wearables that we are carrying uh, or all these behavioral data in usage of uh, technology, da, da, da. I mean, this is something that is unsolved. I mean, we really, we, ha we feel that we have a lot of data, but the data that we have is uh, from the contacts that we have with the healthcare system. All the other, we haven't been successful, uh, successfully able to integrate it. And that's uh, a challenge that, well, we need to solve in case uh, yeah, we want to advance this. I think that we have other uh, countries slash regions that will be in front of that. Uh, for example, we all know China, they consider data as, as a public good. And then therefore, uh, because of this, they can do whatever. So I'm sure that they link health data with the activity in social media and whatever, they don't care. But here, uh, well, at least in Europe, this will be the, 
very difficult to do from a regulatory perspective, I believe. Thank you. I don't know whether there's already a last question from the audience. Otherwise, I, if you would have a question, please stand because it's hard to see any fingers here. I don't think there are questions. I, I have one final question, and I think Alisa I asked it to you, but invite the others also to continue. I think you, you, you posed an intriguing example of uh, Kevin versus Jamal, where two similar individuals with similar complaints, uh, I think, uh, asked a question in ChatGPT, what should I do? And they got quite different um, uh, 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 advice. And, and what would we need to do to improve, let's say, fairness and equality? So uh, to make sure that in the future, Kevin and Jamal would similar sort of starting positions receive similar uh, advice from, from tools like ChatGPT. You know, it's much easier to criticize than it is to uh, fix, right? We're all, we're all in that. Um, so I, I would, number one, I would echo something that Christina, I think, reminded us, which is that, you know, uh, we need education and we, we actually need sort of profound education on being critically minded citizens of technological output, right? I, I was in the workshop yesterday on AI and um, there was a lot of discussion about the value of AI to shortcut training of providers, right? That you could synthesize vast amounts of literature, give somebody like, you know, very high level summary and, you know, that as an educator and a scientist, it deeply worries me because it suggests that we are really gonna leapfrog over some mastery of information tools and the learning process and default to, to machines. So I think, you know, um, we are at a, a cliff or an inflection point where we have to pay attention to education from childhood on about, you know, what are the risks and benefits of technology and how to think critically about it and retain your integrity as a thinker, that's number one. Um, number two, I think we have to really invest in specific education about how to use these technical tools for physicians and the healthcare workforce. I think there's very little of it, very little appreciation. So, I, you know, I would say that. Um, and then I think there are technological approaches that can address and flag disparities, right? But we have to build and tune systems. You know, I'm involved in a project where they're um, probably gonna compete AIs against each other, you know, to identify disparities and recommendations. So there may be some, you know, technological solutions to this. Um, and the last thing, of course, is, you know, in reference to the garbage in, garbage out, bias in, bias out, is that the more we have very comprehensive, um, rich data, right, uh, you know, that is curated against bias and checked for bias, those recommendations may be fairer. Thank you. Very clear. I think, uh, is there anyone who wants to? Well, I, thi I think a lot can be said about the example that Elisa provided. It's, it's a very, very amazing and very speaking example of what bias in AI and in humans is. Um, generally, what she said as well about the critical thinking education and our awareness of what being a digital citizen is and what's, what we need to pay attention to is that also very much resonates with, with what I think. And I, I just may, maybe would like to add that um, this is this bias is maybe one of the reasons that AI has been used a lot for disinformation purposes. So while younger people, they tend to be more um, well aware of how to behave, behave in the digital space, like in cyberspace, and they are aware that the outputs of chat GPT are to be tested and to be questioned. I think for older generations specifically, uh, it's it's very hard to, um, to explain what's, uh, what sort of responsibility and what sort of new education being a digital citizen is. And like I have a very anecdotal experience of that with, with my uh, grandmother who I taught to use chat GPT um, because she doesn't speak uh, English too well, but she's a sociologist and she's 
uh, retired from a while ago, but she wants to have like synthesized of um, papers from different languages and then use Google Translate to, to read them. She's still very active in that and that's, that's amazing. But um, she asked ChatGPT for some references and he like ChatGPT hallucinated references for her. And she was like, but Google doesn't have those references and it was very hard for me to explain to her that he just, ChatGPT just makes things up. So I, I think there's this aspect for, uh, you know, education that should come at all levels and we, we should not forget about elder people and way, where they come in this whole discourse mm -hmm. about education. So. Thank you. I think considering the time we have to sort of wrap this session up and but for me, it's a, need a, a big message is that the technology is already quite advanced and that there's been big steps in what's technologically possible, but I think it's a big challenge for us to sort of find out what we as humans can do with this technology, where we want it to go, go and where we want to apply it and where we don't. And I hope the contributions in this session have sort of uh, made your minds ready to think about this in the, in the coming weeks and, uh, and months maybe. Um, I would like to thank again the speakers for their, for their presentations. I would like to thank the WAVE project for making the session possible. And I would like to thank you, the audience, for uh, being with, you, with us here uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much.